Yeah, thank you very much for attending this uh, talk. I'm very happy to visit Keio University and be in Japan again after, yeah, indeed nine years. So <laughs> it's really nice to meet up all old friends from the good old times and be able to travel a bit in Japan. So uh, yeah, so I gave this talk a short version of this already at this workshop that we had last week. Actually, I gave a talk yesterday, so I can repeat the talk today. But we have more time to discuss. Uh, if there's more questions, just interrupt me straight away because it's much easier. So this um, title was already announced. So we work indeed on phosphorus doped silicon um, MOSFETs. And the work I did was in collaboration mainly with uh, Dr. Hans Hubel. He, he joined us for a year um, in Sydney, but he originally came from the Walter Schottky Institute with Martin Brunt and yeah, Hiroki Kuhn went there. Yeah. Last yeah. December, came back. Yes. Very nice group, good yeah. people. Um, Bob Sterrett is one of our old um, lab persons. He's there forever. <laughs> he is very, very experienced. Uh, and, and at the moment, um, our old boss left two years ago, and Andrea filled up his position, basically. So um, maybe to go straight into the readout mechanism, that is um, at least to some extent important for this work. Um, this is a picture I, I, I took over from the paper, the PRL paper from Gavin Morley, um, where he described the mechanism that underlies this readout, this EDMR readout in the MOSFET. And uh, that actually refers back to this much older paper from the, sixth, from the 70s, actually 80s, um, by Thornton and Honig, who were one of the pioneers of this, um, well, both photo-induced and, and recombination type readout in, in, in silicon MOSFETs. And um, so just to show you what uh, a, a resonant condition does on a, on a source drain current in a MOSFET is that, um, so, so basically imagine you have no spin resonance applied. You just send the current from a, a source to a drain. So of course the carriers go via the conduction band. And then uh, at, at some uh, field and temperature there's some spin polarization, which in gen generally is quite different from the conduction band electrons than for isolated donors. And um, then um, typically the ground state's occupied most of the time. That means that um, the spins in the donor and in the conduction band have on average the same spin. There are more of those spins uh, available. So those, those are triplet configurations because they have the same spin. With triplet I mean um, the donor spin has one type of spin and then the conduction band electron has another type of spin. If they're both up, then I call that the triplet. And so maybe, maybe I should spend a bit of time to explain what this D0 and D- minus is. Um, if you have the 31 phosphorus atom in silicon, then um, if the donor is activated only, you have one electron attached to the atom of phosphorus. But in principle, you can add another electron to that. And then you can form the D minus state, which is a singlet state. And then there are higher energy excitations, which are triplets. Um, but at the moment, I, I only consider the D minus. And so what can happen um, is that if the conduction band electron is down, it can actually go into the D minus state. And then it will form a singlet. But if the spin is up, you cannot go into the state and form a triplet, a singlet, because it's actually a triplet situation. So this is like a spin, Pauli spin blockade effect that's also reported for the double quantum dots. So what you have to do to make that process on average more likely is to flip either this spin or this spin, which you can do with ESR. So the picture denotes the case where you flip the electron on the donor side, then the conduction band electron can go in there, you form the D minus state, and um, then also you can release that electron, and then it can contribute to the current again. So it's this ESR driven difference in total scattering rate that underlies the mechanism. Now there are other mechanisms as well, like um, spin dependent recombination, but um, I don't consider this at the moment, but 
I think in general there is a combination of these effects going on. I just can't um, separate them at the moment. I have to mention that in all the experiments we do, we do not shine light on the device. So there are no electron hole carriers. We only work with carriers, electrons in the conduction band. So that, that's sort of a difference than the experiments that uh, you, you are doing and are doing here. Um, so a little bit on the motivation, why, why this work is interesting. This is a picture I um, adapted from the uh, Berkeley group and uh, it displays this uh, very small FinFET transistor. And um, in principle you can do this EDMR readout through this very small transistor. And then um, if you put a single ion in there, it has a single phosphorus atom in there. It has only one nucleus. So the nuclear spin can be up or down. And so if you can detect with this uh, EDMR technology signature or an EDMR spectrum that only shows a left or a right hyperfine line, that's a signature of the nuclear state being up or down. Now, generally, you see the, here this plotted three lines. Um, that middle line is represented by either a uh, PB center, I guess, or a two-deck resonance. I'll come to that later. Um, so, phosphorus and silicon in general have very long coherence times. I mean, that's uh, the second thing to remember that's really important here. So, ultimately, we want to sort of make a, a solid-state quantum memory by virtue of these long coherence times. So what this enables you to do ultimately, provided you can actually measure this sensitively enough, is to do a nuclear spin readout via the EDMR technique. And this paper um, uh, in detail describes the, 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 the limitation of this technology. So, so we know that um, a solid state quantum memory has already been implemented in uh, bulk doped phosphorus crystals. So the Oxford group, in particular John Morton, um, actually implemented this for phosphorus and silicon um, with standard NMR and EPR technologies. And so what they did is they, um, they initially created a um, coherence in the electron spin basis, then transferred that by a uh, pulse to, the, um, to a coherence between the nuclear spin states, and then um, actually uh, map that back on the electron spin. And then they could show that the lifetime of that coherence could be preserved over much longer times in the nuclear spin basis. And that's because the nuclear are, are much more isolated than the electron spins. So it would be, of course, much nicer if you can think of a way to repeat that experiment but then on a much smaller few sp a spin case. Because uh, these are some kind of limitations that this technology, the conventional technology, um, is printed. So for instance, first of all, you require a really large number of spins to do that experiment. And even if you um, completely remove the silicon 29s, the dipolar coupling between the phosphorus electron spins could still limit you, your coherence times. The other thing that this conventional technology does is that instead of probing only a small ensemble of spins, it actually probes the whole sample. Because every, everything you put into that cavity is, is ex ex uh, excited, first of all, and therefore you, you also see contributions from um, other defects that are in that volume. So if you have a big, if you have a not so good oxide somewhere, there's a large PB effect, PB center, that can appear in the spectrum. And that can actually dominate all the other signals you're interested in. So and that in, in itself will then decrease the, um, the accuracy with which you can measure signatures of donors, for instance. So, and because it's not, it's, so therefore it's not a local spin probing technique. And typical cavities, they are working only at a fixed microwave frequency, uh, X-band, and typically at 4 or 5 Kelvin. Now, because you 
because it works at one frequency only, it's not broadband, which it's required, for instance, if you want to derive g-factors. You have to do many different magnetic fields and frequencies, and then you can get a g-factor. But if you only work at one frequency, it's quite hard to do those experiments and label an exact um, g-factor value to that. And the other thing is, because this is not broadband, you cannot really do FM, which is frequency modulation, or record spectra by not sweeping the magnetic field, but, but frequency sweeps. So there are some limitations of the conventional technology, um, which are challenges for making, um, combining these limitations with EDMR and optimizing the system. So this is the, uh, the Russian forefather, let's say, of the EPR. He was a little bit earlier, I think, than the American um, people. I think it was Purcell and co-workers in America that developed the EPR technique. Um, so just to show you that we can do ion implantation of donors in silicon and actually... So, so what, what we have here is an EPR spectrum. Uh, this is a colleague of mine in Canberra and uh, we have a collaboration uh, going on to prove that when we implant donors in our silicon crystal we can actually do that um, and the donors are activated and we can see the signature here of a donor, a phosphorus donor um, hyperfine split signal and we see this huge center peak here well it's a little bit to the side of the center actually and that's the, the PB defect that I was talking about. So, I mean, this is a monster compared to the phosphorus signal here. And so, and this is one of the things that comes out because you have this conventional technique. Um, so, because the nuclear spin is half, you get only two lines. So this, uh, we also did an experiment where we implanted three-half arsenic. And what you then see are four lines. So, you see one, two, three... It's actually a fifth line. We don't know yet what it is, but um, the splitting there is about 72 to 76 Gauss between lines. And again, of course, that big PB defect. So this is just to show you that you can implant donors, activate them by doing a, a rapid thermal anneal, and then do conventional spectroscopy. So we are quite confident that now we can also have these small FinFETs or MOSFETs, implant them with this technology, and then do EDMR on those. This is not EDMR, this is conventional EPR. So in 2006, a colleague of mine in Sydney have, with collaborators has already shown that by doing photo-induced EDMR uh, on a very small ensemble of donors, they were able to observe the spectrum. Uh, so this is a really sensitive spin detection. So remember, this is with the optical excited, uh, done with the optical excited technology. On the other hand, we know from um, the group in Yale, quite a while now ago now, that they were able to measure um, SETs very sensitively using uh, cryogenic tank circuits. So they had LCR circuits at low temperature coupled to a sing single electron transistor, and that gives you a very high sensitive charge detection. So our idea was then, why don't we combine this together to create a very sensitive EDMR readout? And that, that is the topic of this talk. Now the local ESR comes in, uh, from my experience in Delft, where in 2006 we used this um, strip line. So this is a, a, a little transmission line on the chip that can create very small magnetic fields, but only where this uh, metal is short-circuited. And so this is one way to create a local magnetic field at a site where you want it to be. And in this case, we had a, a double quantum dot in gallium arsenide. And we would like to flip only the spin in this left dot. And that's why you see there's, uh, the left dot is just there. We had an insulator patent over this double dot. And then we put down a metal. And in that way, we were able to do um, single electron spin qubit manipulations. So we knew that this strip line technology worked and we used it for the silicon MOSFET. So this is the device. You see now the strip line is uh, 90 degree rotated. You see this is the aluminium strip line, which is also the gate 
of our uh, MOSFET. So what it is, is accumulation mode MOSFET. It's, uh, it's bog dope natural silicon, about 10 to the 17 per cube centimeter. So if you work out the area here, times the bog dope concentration, there are about 3,000 spins. So you have to put this in perspective to the 10 to the, well, I think for continuous wave, wave EPR, there's about a minimum of 10 to the 9 on 10 spins you use. So that's seven, six, seven orders smaller than what you would do with conventional EPR technology. Um, so we have a, a phosphorus indiffused source and drain. So in the future, we want to replace this with ion implantation, just like you do. Um, so we grow a very high quality oxide. This is the um, ultra dry oxidation technique. And we create a window with a thickness of 20 nanometer, which is the gate dielectric. So we put the, um, the leads in first, then we oxidize this high quality oxide, and then we put the gate down. We also do a, a last step of this process. It's called a forming gas anneal, um, which reduces the trap density. So this is the, the standard combination of hydrogen and nitrogen at high temperature. Um, so this can be used to now create the field required for EDMR. Um, and at the same time, you can use the DC offset voltage to gate the device, to create a current from source to drain. So, um, yeah, one more thing. The field orientation is, of, of course, important. So we have the DC field perpendicular to the device. So the field from the superconducting magnet um, is like this. The sample sits horizontally. And then you think about this loop. The B1 field will sit in plane with the device. So in principle, um, that will be the orientation for like a hull bore measurement. Uh, where, the, where you have the perpendicular field configuration. So we did some simulations on the strip line. Just to show you that you can actually create the B1 field in the plane of the device that you want. So we can use a, a standard well, simulation package that uh, is basically a three-dimensional electromagnetic field solver. And then if you just put this structure in here, you just draw that in the, in the package, and you, you define a meshing grid. You can um, get these fields out. So this is the magnetic field in the x, y, and z direction at the very end of this strip line. And indeed, you see that in this direction, which is the in-plane direction of the, the device, there is the magnetic field that you want. And that only sits directly under the gate where the donors are. So this indeed shows that you can create a local magnetic field to only excite those 3,000 spins and nowhere else because the orientation is wrong. It's only this component of HY that can do any spin excitation. So you cannot say that with this orientation you excite the ohmic reservoirs further away because the field is only that local. So that's a really nice um, technology. So I calculated then from the amplitude here that minus 20 dBm at the input of the chip, not at the microwave source, at the chip, creates about one gauss in uh, magnetic field intensity. And which, which is roughly uh, the value we expect by comparing the spectra between frequency modulation and magnetic field modulation. I'll show you that later. The other nice thing about this is the following thing that, you know, at high frequencies, there's this thing called the skin effect. The skin effect basically means that for very high frequency signals, the current through conductors is flowing on the edges of the, of the metal. And so, indeed, what you expect is um, that um, the current will flow on the edges of this metal on both sides towards the short. But that effect can only occur when there's a finite electric field. And so you see that here, for instance, the current flows on the edges first in both conductors, 
but then it sort of merges and becomes a more homogeneous current distribution. And we think that is because the electric field there goes to zero. So it's the opposite case. Whenever you have a short termination, there can't be an electric field because it's short-circuited. And therefore, um, the skin effect disappears. So, yeah. And then one more thing on this slide. In the previous orientation, so in this work, the magnetic field that was used to drive the Rabi oscillations was um, was it, uh, perpendicular to the plane. So in this device, the magnetic field statically was in the plane. And that corresponds to the Z component of the magnetic field. We actually use the Y component. So that's slightly different. So how do we hook up the sample? It's very simple, actually. Um, the sample sits in a um, brass box at the bottom of the dilution refrigerator at a 80 millikelvin typically and then we have the superconducting magnet to induce the DC field and then we have a high frequency line microwave coax and the pin of that coax sticks through that metal box and then we bond, we wire bond from the coax pin directly to the strip line. So I have to mention that this is not perfect you lose a lot of uh, signal there because it's the impedance mismatch. But this is one way of doing it uh, quickly. And then we can either do field modulation with the small extra coil we have, or we can do frequency modulation by modulating the microwave signal. It's all right. So then what we do, we cool this down to 100 millikelvin, and at about one Tesla, we already have 100% polarization of the donors. This is extremely quickly. I think if you do the experiment at 5 Kelvin or 4, it's about 5%. It depends on the magnetic field. It does, that's right. Um, so at the moment we do, we obtain those spectra that I'll show you next by field sweeps, but we really would like to be able to do one static field and sweep the microwave frequency. You can imagine what a, what a breakthrough that will be because you can do this very quickly. And it also means you can do adiabatic fast passage. That means you sweep through the frequency resonance quicker than the relaxation time. So you can do things like population inversion and so on. So I don't really have to show you this, I think. This is just the standard um, few graphs for showing how ESR work works, but um, because we do a field and frequency um, modulation, just remember that what you expect to see are derivative signals, not uh, absorption lines, because we do lock-in detection. So then the energy spectrum of the, signals of the system, we have uh, the Zeeman electron Zeeman splitting, we have the additional nuclear Zeeman splitting, and then we have a hyperfine coupling. And the, the resulting Hamiltonian of that uh, gives you four levels, obviously, uh, but with a different nuclear splitting between the uh, lower two levels and the upper two levels. So when you do EPR, you conserve the nuclear quantum number. So you should get um, only two lines. If you do NMR, you preserve the electron spin quantum number. And you observe two lines, but then at megahertz, because it's an NMR transition. So this is the result for the EDMR case. These uh, spectra indeed show that there's the 4.2 millitesla splitting of two hyperfine lines. So that corresponds to the phosphorus and silicon, the left and right hyperfine line. And we see the signal in the middle. And that central resonance here uh, is due to the um, two-dimensional electron gas that you just accumulate with the gate. So that, that makes sense. If you would reduce that gate, you can't measure anymore because the current goes down, but then this peak would in principle drop because there's no carriers anymore. 
Um, if you do a optical induced EDMR experiment, you don't gate the device, so then you wouldn't see that peak. But you would still see those lines. Um, now, the nice thing is that we're not limited to one cavity frequency. Because we have this strip line, we can go to all these different frequencies. And in this case, I, uh, I went to, I think, 20, 30, 40 gig, and then reverse the magnetic field as well to get a broader range. And then you can linear fit and get a G factor of 1.999. And this technique is sort of sensitive to the third digit of the G factor. So it's, it's rather accurate. It's not, I think you can do better in um, traditional ways, but, and this just confirms that you can now label G factors to the defects you observe. Now the other thing that's interesting is that for this particular case, you see that the line shape for the lines for the phosphorus are completely different than for the line shape of the inner resonance. And we think that's because the T1 time for phosphorus donors and for two-dimensional electron gas electrons are different. So if the T1 time is very long for the donors and you do the experiment quickly, um, you could do an adiabatic fast passage. Uh, that could, in principle, yield such a, uh, a, a function of the, of the line width, which is not derivative. Um, but then again, I have to say that we have also observed spectra where all the lines are derivative. So it's not clear at the moment that it's really due to this T1 um, differences only. But what, what is interesting as well is that comparing the field modulated case with the frequency modulated case, that cleans up the spectrum quite a bit. So you see all this noise that you have here is sort of gone when you go to frequency modulation. And that could be um, explained by the fact that if you sweep fields, you always create eddy currents and um, that could interfere with lock-in measurements. So it's actually better to do frequency modulation. Finally, this is the DC current through the device on the same um, field axis that just shows you that when you hit the central resonance, the current drops. And it's this current sign drop that tells you that whenever you hit the resonance, the resistance increases. So this indeed confirms sort of, or it backs up the idea that there's a trapping mechanism going on underlying this readout because the current drops and doesn't increase. Okay, so this is still all DC readout. Now let's switch to the RF readout. So what we did is we added this low temperature resonant LCR circuit at the bottom of the fridge while maintaining all the electronics for doing the low frequency DC readout. And this um, LCR circuit allows you to transform the impedance of the sample to a 50 ohm coax transmission line. Now the benefit of doing this impedance transformation is that you have a readout technology that is much more wideband and much more sensitive than doing DC measurements. And so together with Hans, we have set up this experiment and where we use the device, the MOSFET, as a resistor in this LCR circuit. So to complete this circuit, we have added an inductor and the capacitance is just the stray capacitance, the parasitic capacitance from source to drain. So that's sort of um, a parameter you, you can hardly tune. But by tuning this L and this R, the R can, you can change this by the gate, you can actually form a resonance circuit. And here you see the resonance in the uh, reflection of a carrier you send down. As a, and you see that the resonance frequency is about 380 five megahertz. 
And then this modulation between on and off is the difference when you match when you match the circuit on, 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 uh, on resonance or when you don't match it. And so you can, by changing the gate, you get a, a different reflection coefficient. And this is the function of this resonance intensity uh, as a function of the current through the device or the gate voltage. And you see that for a particular gate voltage or current, the reflected signal goes to zero. So that means that all the incident RF signal does not come back. It's all absorbed at the device, at this matching point. And it's exactly there where you're extremely sensitive to changes in, to changes in the resistance for EDMR readout. And then that gives you a big signal in the RF signal. So this is the conversion of EDMR signal in terms of changes in current to a high speed radio frequency line. And the nice thing is that we have this DC and RF at the same time is you can now calibrate RF and DC. So because you, you can fit a line through this, you know how much current corresponds to how much RF. And so you can compare the RF spectra with the DC spectra. Okay, so now it, it, gets, it becomes a, a, quite a bit tricky to see, but remember the spectra that I showed you before, it has three lines. Now, in the RF spectra, we operate, first of all, near the matching point. And for that matching point to operate there, you need to apply quite a bit of gate voltage. At the same time, if you want to do DC measurements, you don't want to have too much current to the device. So we're sort of limited by small source drain voltages, but have to have therefore a large gate voltage. Otherwise we could not operate at that matching point. So just remember that in this case, DC, the bias is about 100 millivolt, but on the matching point it's actually much smaller. And that's why it's actually one millivolt there. So the source drain bias is much smaller in, the, in this uh, experiment because we wanted to have the RF working and the DC too. And what you then see is not three lines, but you only see that one line, which is the two-dimensional electron gas line. And, and we think that this absence of the hyperfine line resonances for this low bias um, is, is, is really apparent. And there is a dependence on this uh, hyperfine visibility on the bias, which is striking because we never observed that before. And you, and you don't a priori expect that. So what we did see was the two-dimensional electron gas line, this one. And so we just continue to work with that because that's the one we could only observe at the matching point where the RF works. So then we compared again the DC and the RF case, gives you similar spectra. And additionally, you see a small feature there in the middle of that big line, and that's the phosphorus exchange signal. So for the doping concentrations we use, we expect a tiny bit of exchange. That means the overlap of the phosphorus electron wave function with the other electron and um, therefore you get a signal not at the hyperfine lines but in the middle. And that's why you can see that extra peak there. So we know that there's phosphorus in the sample, not only from this exchange, um, also from the other spectra, but really the hyperfine lines that you expect on the outside here, they're gone. And that's because of the low bias we used. So it's one millivolt here, versus 100 in the other case. So we can continue a bit with this RF. We can now remove the lock-in and just take that reflected signal and measure that in nine sweeps. And then because we don't have a lock-in, 
we just recorded on a digital storage oscilloscope, you see that we already get the signal out, which is now the integrated version of the derivative signal, of course, because there's no lock-in. But it shows you how accurate, how sensitive this RF technology is. And the other thing we did is we can now show that this technique is very sensitive and it has broadband properties. So by changing the modulation rate of the FM to a megahertz, we'll, we were able with RF to still see the signal, which is just the peak to peak of the two deck line. So this shows you that you have at least one megahertz of bandwidth to detect EDMR signals, which is good. In principle, you can actually push that. We were here limited by electronics. But in principle, you can push that much further. The intrinsic bandwidth is given by the full width half max of that resonance, which is about 20 megahertz. So if you use a bit better electronics, you can extend this 20 times in that direction to 20 megahertz, which is extremely good if you want to do Rabi spin detection electrically. So that's the promise this technology has. So just to uh, show you that indeed we observed this bias dependence, we um, studied this in the um, in the in the uh, MOSFET. So what we did is work work out what the peak to peak amplitude is of these all these three resonances as a function of the bias. And indeed, that you see for these larger biases, the hyperfine lines creep up, and the two deg line sort of stays roughly where it is. So there's a dramatic increase on the bias, which confirms that that is the reason that we did not see the hyperfine lines before, because that was, remember, at one millivolt. So that's even like in this range here. Now, just to show you that that bias dependence is also observed in the RF. So if you think of an RF signal, it's nothing different than a DC signal. It just, it just has, in this case, at 300 megahertz. But if you have this uh, resonant circuit, then this RF signal is converted in an effective oscillating source drain voltage. And so, in this experiment, we were actually not exactly working at the matching point. We were sort of working here, close to the matching point, but not exactly. And therefore, the Q of the system is not as high as it can be, which means that the RF signal is not translated in the RF voltage very efficiently. So now, if you operate exactly at that matching point, all the, the, the RF signal that comes in is translated in 2 times Q times the incident power, which is the oscillating voltage across the MOSFET. And then you can see in the RF the uh, hyperfine lines that we did not see before. So this confirms that not only in the DC case we can see the hyperfine lines, it's also now possible to see it in the RF. So that's a really good sign that this will actually work for doing um, high-speed detection of uh, rabies in phosphor stones. So this is just one of the last slides that shows you what happens when you um, up the power of the microwaves uh, for all these three resonances. And you can see that you can actually saturate those lines while you increase the power. And um, saturation is good because then you can actually um, fit, you can fit the saturation with the saturation function. And if you assume a homogeneous line broadening, which is, which is not, because there's silicon 29 in the crystal, but um, if you nevertheless take that function and you fit that with a saturation function, you can get a value for T1, T2 product, which is the uh, product of the 
spin relaxation time and the spin defacing time. And um, you can only do that if you know what the magnetic field is. But because we did simulations, we can estimate what the field is for each power. So then we can do this fit and we can get this value out. So I don't know what T1 is. I don't know what T2 is. But what I can say is something about the product. So that's very interesting. The other thing you can see is that the saturation point for the donors happens earlier than for the two deck, which could also say something about the time scales for relaxation in, for these two different electron spins. Um, finally, if you do a standard EPR experiment, I think what happens is that the signal you see of the lines scales with the magnitude of the magnetic field, the B1 field. Here we observe a linear dependence of the uh, EDMR intensity with microwave power. Um, that actually says it's related to the square of B1. So there's a slight difference between EPR and EDMR. Um, so I'll just summarize here and then we can talk about other stuff or if you have any questions. I showed you the uh, spectroscopy of phosphorus and silicon using DC readout. Then I showed you that we can complement this with a radio frequency readout. And then I showed you this um, non-trivial dependence of EDMR resonances depending on the MOSFET parameters like the bias, the power, and in principle there are gate dependencies as well that I haven't touched upon. But So um, maybe one more slide to show you what we, uh, who we want to acknowledge for this work. Of course the, fund, the funding agencies, um, some people in the lab, the Australian uh, research government. And then um, what we want to do with this later. So this will be a plan for the coming years for uh, what we want to do. So of course we want to do post EDMR experiments. That has already been nicely demonstrated in Germany but that was for the case where you use optical light to do the EDMR. Now there's one problem with that technology that you have recommendation which limits the coherence times of the electron spins. But it would be nice to do it with this gated version, no light, to see what the comparison will be. Well, the other thing you can do is think about making LCR circuits on a chip. And that can allow you then to work at much higher RF frequencies. So this RF readout is not done yet. You can do much, much better than 20 megahertz by, by making things on chip, which allows you then to work maybe on uh, 100 nanoseconds or smaller time scales. Then the next thing you can do that I haven't showed you is um, ENDOR. So this is the electron nuclear double resonance to access the nuclear spins. So now that we are able to see in the RF the uh, phosphorus and silicon hyperfine lines, we know um, that we have phosphorus there, but you can do um, an NMR experiment at the same time. So if you do ENDOR, you will figure out where the NMR transitions are. And then you can, you can start to play to pulse that and implement a few spin quantum memory. Now this is all very nice for qubit and um, quantum computers. On the other hand, this technology gives you something about the device physics as well. For instance, if you do single ion implantation, you can control the, the depth of the donor, the type of donor, and the position in the crystal. Whether you implant it shallow or very, very deep and far away from the interface. If you do that, this will result in different signatures of the EDMR spectrum. So EDMR can be used as a tool to observe what the, what the effect is of all these different parameters. Also the quality of the oxide, really important for CMOS industry, can be sort of controlled or can be 
tested with EDMR? The activation of donors, and what's the damage introduced by ion implantation? The next thing on the Outlook agenda is to try to push this EDMR to much lower frequencies and much, much smaller magnetic fields. And the idea is that, of course, the polarization gets smaller, but what you gain as well is a, a better, much better microwave coupling. Because now you don't have to operate at 40 gigahertz, you can operate at RF frequencies. So if you want to do pulsed experiments and you need a lot of power, it's much better to have a better coupling and, and do that at lower fields because then the frequency is much smaller. Um, and to get rid of this silicon 29, 29 in the crystal, um, you can think of doing this experiment on silicon 28 epilayers. We tried that, but we did not see any EDMR signal. And we think that the quality of these wafers is not good enough compared to the natural silicon wafers we get. It could be that there are a lot of um, complementary dopants in there, like boron and, and so on. So, yeah, so this is sort of the plan for the future. Um, and it's really interesting these days what's going to happen because a lot of people are actually working in this field and a lot of progress has been made. So I think at the moment I'll just stop here and give time for some questions. Thank you.